Hey, you guys. Uh, greetings, greetings from, from all America. All America. Um, um, I'm just going to be a one-minute awesome, minute awesome praise, praise report. report. Uh, so, this uh, so this last year, year my, wife my wife's staff and one of our, and one of our Chinese, Chinese teammates were out what we call broad sewing, so doing street evangelism in a park in, a park in Bouchon Bay. Um, as, they as they wandered along, they didn't meet very many people. It was kind of early morning for Bouchon Bay anyways. And so anyways, they're wandering along. They ran into this older-looking woman who was looking at a piece of workout equipment. And Steph tried to speak to her in Tajik because we speak Tajik. And, and she didn't really, she didn't really respond, respond. So, so Eunice, our Chinese, our Chinese girl, girl tried, to tried to speak to her in Chinese, Chinese which, we which we didn't think would work either. And she responded, and she responded in, Russian. in Russian. And so, and so anyways, anyways, my wife, my wife was like, oh, too bad, oh, too bad in, English. in English. And she said, oh, you speak English. Long story short, her name's Takmina. They started talking in a little bit of English they had. She had a little bit of Tajik. My wife was trying her little bit of Russian. They started talking. And Steph started talking about Jesus. Well, long story short, by the second time they got together, She's, She's like, you know, like, you know what? what? I want this Jesus in my life. I want him to be my God. And so, so second, time second time they got together, she asked Jesus in her heart. And we spent the last many months uh, discipling her. And, um, and um, now, as we, as we are back here in America, she's plugging into a good Russian, 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 Russian speaking Russian church in Taj. And, and it's just been kind of an amazing season. Beyond that, just last week, a bunch of our national partners baptized nine new Tajik believers. And so, anyways, thank you guys. Bless you guys harvest time. We're just so appreciating you guys. And hope to talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Good morning, Harvest Time. Good morning. All right, go ahead and stand up. We're going to jump right into worship this morning. I praise in the valley and praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure and praise when I'm doubting I praise when I'm numbered and praise when surrounded Praise cause the war my enemies drown it as long as long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to pray
to the mountain. Come on, let's sing it out again. I'll praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. And praise when I'm surrounded. Cause praise is the waters. My enemies drown. Can we sing it one more time? As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray. in this place we thank you that we can gather together as a spiritual family and worship you we say come Holy Spirit come ignite our hearts in love and passion for you and we want to be wholehearted followers devoted worshipers following hard after you but our hearts are yours this morning would you connect us to the story that you're telling Jesus' name. In the darkness we were waiting. In the darkness we were waiting. Without hope and without light. Till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word. From the throne of endless glory. To a cradle. Yeah. 
proclaimed Now this gospel truth of old It shall not be and shall not fade In His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected Father, we just honor your name today. We thank, you, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace today. Thank you for sending your son for each one of us. And today, we just, we surrender. We come into this house anticipating, expecting, longing for you to move in our hearts today. We just say, Heavenly Father, may you have your way right now in our hearts and in this moment, may you have your way. We say that your kingdom come, your will be done right now in this place, in our hearts, in our minds, that you would transform the way that we think. We proclaim 2 Corinthians that you would renew our minds today, but you would give us an understanding and a definition of who you say we are as your children. We just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. See, we're going to stay in prayer for just a moment here, just a couple different prayer points. One, we're, we're going to continue to pray for Israel. I mean, they're still in.
constant battle. I mean, it's the American way, right? We get, we get shell-shocked and we just kind of forget. But they're still in everyday battles. We have a couple different missionaries that are on the ground over there. Uh, uh, Hannah and Nolan Tarantino, they live in uh, Tel Aviv. And then we have Shane and Rebecca Betcher that are living in central Israel. And we just want to lift them up for safety today. Uh, we got a, a, a video update yesterday from uh, Hannah and Nolan and then just sharing. Uh, they opened a coffee shop in Tel Aviv to be able to minister. And they said that it has amplified in this day them being able to serve and them being able to just be God's hands and feet in Tel Aviv right now. How many know that there are sirens in Tel Aviv, which is on the farthest border to the uh, Mediterranean Sea? So they're, they're up against the sea, but they're still every day going out and just being able to pray with people, and their kids are playing with people in the parks, and they're able to have conversations about hope and goodness and joy because it's Jesus, and that's what they're standing in. So we're going to lift them up as a family. We're going to lift the Betchers up as a family. Uh, we're going to lift up just Israel as a nation. So why I'm saying all this is I'm giving you information to be able to pray into different points where God touched your heart as I was just talking because there's power in how we pray. And praying out loud and standing together as we pray, it's God amplifying these days, all right? So just allowing yourself to be part of what's going on. I'm going to pray out loud. You pray with me out loud, and let's just lift them up, all right? So Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for, for, for Israel. God, for the ways that, that you continue to pour your hand over them as a nation, but God, also those that stand with them. So God, we just proclaim right now that your holy hand move within Israel today. God, that you would bring a restoration into that land, that they would find out the truth of who you are, Jesus. God, that you are their Messiah. Jesus, you are the Messiah that has come back for them. We pray that you would renew their hearts, renew their minds right now in these days. And we just pray your direction and hand over them. We pray safety over Hannah and Nolan and their boys. God, that you would just grant them your hand of safety as they go to and from, as they're able to share your truth and your word, as they're able to just bless people with, with coffee. <laughs> just the simplicity of coffee, God, that you open up doors of conversation. So God, we pray that every step they take, that you would take before them, that you would guide them, that you would be in their words, that, that every word that comes out of their mouth would be an uplifting testimony unto you. So God, we just pray over the Tarantinos as safety right now safety. We just say, God, have your way within the avenues that they're walking right now. Give direction as they, they pursue and come after you. And we say, Holy Spirit, speak boldly to them. We pray over the Betcher family, Shane and Rebecca and the kids. We just say, God, that, that you would use them in the areas that they're still in the moment right now, day to day. God, that as they go to and from home, God, that you would use their voice God, that you would just allow them to continue to be stirring as a family to reach those that are around them in their community. So God, we pray the holy hand of God to protect them. We just thank you. We pray that same protection over Israel as a nation, over missionaries and friends that we have on the ground over there. God, we just pray that you would hold them, keep them, direct them, and move in them. We just praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Whew. Amen. Hebrews 10, 22, it says, Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. Fully trusting. Today, can we fully trust Him? Going in with sincere heart, going in with everything. God, I've got everything right here on this plate for you. You mold it, you direct it, you guide it. However you want to move today, God, you have it. It's yours. I'm surrendering. I'm, I'm giving it up. So we thank you, Jesus, for all the things that you do in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, you may be seated. Greet somebody as you're finding a seat. Tell them how glorious they are. Uh, amen. Hey, thank you, worship team. Hey, we're going to jump into a few announcements here. I just want to want to give you guys a couple of things. Uh, we've got youth convention coming up this weekend, this upcoming weekend. Uh, it's going to be an amazing weekend for our youth. Uh, and I'll say this. If you have youth that are longing and wanting to still go to youth convention, today is the absolute last day. 
form comes down tomorrow morning because obviously we got to hit hotel rooms and stuff like that. So if you've got any youth, maybe it's neighbor kids or grandkids or kids or you might know a kid, I don't know, but uh, invite them to youth convention this weekend. Uh, you can see Pastor Dan or Beth or uh, Pastor Andy as well. When, when you run into him, you can talk to him as well. So that being said, youth convention. Hey, can we just take a moment and pray for the youth this weekend? Are we okay with that? that they would experience God in a deeper level. Uh, and we're praying across the, the, the state of Wisconsin. There's about 2,000 to 3,000 students that come together. I may be overshooting that a little bit, but that's okay. We're, we're, we're praying for more harvest, yeah? So let's pray over this youth. God, we just thank you for this generation that you're raising up today. God, we pray that you would stir their hearts to an understanding and a desire. God, that they would be a, a pillar in your kingdom in these days. God, that this generation that is going to be spoken to, and God, that you're going to move in and shape and shake and renew. God, we just pray a renewing of the hearts today. And God, this weekend, that you would just move in mighty waves in that convention center. We just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would dwell right now today, that you would prepare, and you would just make it known that you are victor and king. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, youth convention this weekend, also uh, a week from this Tuesday, we're partnering with a couple churches here on the Chippewa Valley. We're going to jump into a Hope Night, which is going to be down at the Lismore on Halloween night. So, no trunk or treat, nothing going on here at this campus. There actually won't even be worship that Tuesday night here. We're just jumping in with uh, Harvest Time Eau Claire, Oasis, and a few other churches that are all partnering together to just press, pray, and believe for God to move and, and break things off in the Chippewa Valley. So that's Halloween night. If you guys want to join us, 6 o'clock down at the Lismore, you'll find more information and emails and things like that. I should probably tell you that too. Hey, if you're a guest with us today, we have Connect cards that are in front of you in the pink back chairs. We want to give you a moment to be able to fill those out, turn them in, because then you'll get email updates and things like that of things happening in the church and going on. But also on the back side of that card, it is blank because we want to stand with you in prayer. Because the Bible talks about it. We've been praying this morning, right? The Bible talks about a praying community is a believing community. We've got to stand together and pray together and press together. So we want to pray together in these days and move together in these moments. So with that, I'm trying to think. Any other announcements that I'm missing? See, I have Beth here today, so I can actually ask her. Last week, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. What's happening? But I think that's it for our announcements. But yesterday, we had a Harvest Fest, which is just coming together. We had a chili cook-off and all kinds of other good things. So I want to take a moment because we have a update highlight video of all the excitement yesterday. If you missed it yesterday, don't worry. It'll come again in about 365 days. It's going to... 64 days. It's coming quick. No, 63 it is a leap year. I don't know. Days are hard. That's math and understanding. That's, that's way out of my zone. So turn your attention to the screen. I'll come back up in just a moment.
Amen. Hey, it was a great day yesterday. It was a lot of fun. It was a little windy, but hey, that's okay. It was a great day to eat a lot of chili and get warmed up, either spicy or just hot. It was good and amazing. So with that, hey, we're going to jump right in, and uh, we're going we're gonna to pray over our tithes and offering today. Uh, the Bible says this. It says in verse 10 of uh, Malachi 3, it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do so, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. So that's, we give God back what he's already given to us. We bring the tithe into the house for him, and we allow him to bless because it's already his. Amen? So I just want to pray over you. You can give a couple different ways. There's a box in the back that you can drop uh, your tithe off, or you can give online at htcfamily.org. But I just want to pray over you and bless as you give back to him. So God, we just thank you. We thank you for a giving congregation that believes in who you are and how you move and the ways that you move in these days. And God, we just open the storehouse right now. God, we say the doors are wide open as we bring them to you. God, we just pray that you would bless these people, that you would allow them to feel your presence, that you would allow them to just move in this day. So God, I just pray amplify what needs to be amplified. Restore what needs to be restored. Bless what needs to be blessed. And God, that your holiness would just be filled in these days. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's a good day, amen? So I want to start off with uh, what's happened in this last week because I've been surrounded by, I'm going to use the word glory hounds, and it's been incredible. Um, just this last weekend, uh, my wife and I were uh, in Florida because the Childs family, their oldest son, David, uh, just got married. And so we had an awesome time to spend with them and, and to visit with them, but he, what hit me, I love David, he was in our youth group, I got married, but what hit me that during that wedding was Megan and Paul were a little different, like a lot different. Like Megan and Paul are so on fire for God right now that they can't contain it anymore. And so at her son's wedding, Megan spends about 25 to 30 minutes with Beth and I talking about the fire of God in her life and what he's doing within their family and what he's about to do. They just flew to, right after the wedding, they flew to Africa. They're there right now as we speak, and they're ready to let God be God, and lives are going to be changed forever because they said yes to a call. In that conversation with her, though, um, we're hearing stories. Now, for those of you that remember Paul, he's like, kind of like a church mouse. He doesn't speak very much. And I saw a video of Paul with a megaphone on a street corner pronouncing Jesus Christ as Lord. This fire that he has was so incredible just to see it and to see the passion that they just brought to the table. They just couldn't stop talking about God. It was very, very neat. Wednesday, um, I've been shifting gears and I've been in Rockley's class on Wednesday nights, and if you've not been a part of the Wednesday night class that we have here uh, for adults, it's right out in the cafe, and it is an incredible electric time to be together. He's putting together such a powerful uh, message, but a powerful class that we just dig deep. And for me to sit in a room and not have to be Pastor Dan, but sit in a room and listen to about 20 to 30 people talk about Scripture and use their own circumstances and stories to, to edify the body. It is like the most electric thing, and I look forward to this every single week. So I had that on Wednesday. And then I thought it would be fun to invite a few people to go play disc golf. I used to call it frisbee golf, but I'm not good enough to, you know, I didn't know the difference. So I invited some people to play disc golf, and I had this young guy named Adam Diaz. You guys know that guy? Yeah, so I, I thought we were going to go to a park with a few people. Josue was there as well. Um, and I thought we were going to play a game of disc golf. Like, my objective was to beat these guys. And what I learned quickly is Adam's objective is for encounters with people to share the love of Jesus. And make no mistake, this guy is full tilt, on fire, and crazy because Somebody happened to lose their Frisbee around us, and the next thing I know, we're praying for the Frisbee to show up. And then all of a sudden, he's like, really boldly, do you love Jesus? <laughs> Guy like, kind of takes a couple steps back. And I'm like, wow, this is where we're going. This is fantastic. And he just immediately had this encounter with this guy. 
I mean, someone just playing disc golf and they learn about Jesus. Think about this. Well, it happened three or four different times. And one time we're walking up to a group of young 20-year-olds and they're all cussing as we can hear them in the distance. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun. I, I, I'm, I, selfishly, I'm really excited about how he's going to do this. He happens to lose his Frisbee over by where they are. I, it's, just, it's like the Holy Spirit drift. <laughs> he's walking through the brush. I'm over on the side and I'm, I'm just waiting. I'm just like, what are we doing here? Here we go. Hey! Y'all love Jesus? <laughs> Two guys, yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Walks away. The heart posture that I've been exposed to of it's all about Jesus has been so electric. It's been so encouraging. And it's like, as a pastor, it was very like, wow. I mean, I got my car driving over to the Harvest Fest yesterday. I'm thinking, why am I not playing Frisbee for Jesus? Because my stats are not working in, you know, as far as I'm not good at it. My, I, I can better at talking about Jesus. But, man, it was awesome. So, if you want to ex be experienced to unfire people, come on a Wednesday night service. Hang out with this guy named Adam. He's not here because I would bring him up on stage. Um, but the excitement that we can bring to the table of wanting that personal relationship where we can't contain it. It's been so electric for me this week. Father, thank you for this morning. Father, I just thank you that you are already doing great things. And Father, as we look around, Father, in the world, we listen to the news. We just, in every situation that we find ourselves in, Father, you are moving. And Father, as we dig deep in your word today, I'm praying for just light bulb moments. I'm praying that your Holy Spirit will just guide, direct, encourage, and change our hearts in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. I'm excited about this message today because it's fun. It is a fun. We're, we're closing the series of We Are Seconds. And if you remember when the series started, Pastor Bess is the one that opened it with us, and she couldn't get past the idea of the scripture passage. Let me read the scripture passage. It's found in Matthew 22, verses 37 uh, through 39, it says, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord with your God with all of your hearts, with all of your soul, and all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And second is like it. Excuse me. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Pastor Beth, when she was preaching this message, she could not get past the first parts of how we're called to love God and what does this mean to love God. And this literally was... A, a pattern where she couldn't even get to the second part of that verse and we had to dig deep that day because how important it is to understand fully what it is to put God first and to truly love him to truly know him pastor Carl week two couldn't get past the idea of how can you love others if you can't love yourself and talking about the obstacles we heard about the five friends in our lives the people that speak influences into our hearts and into our lives good and bad but if you can't have a posturing of forgiveness for yourself and love for yourself, how can you move on to the next level of loving others correctly? I had the opportunity to speak in one of the series on the idea of revenge. Remember that, Remember that situation? Or, or creating or harboring bitterness within our hearts where it goes to this idea of retaliation. I tried to open up doors about how I struggle driving a car, worshiping Jesus, and people go by fast, and I want to honk, and then road rage begins. I'll show them the love of Jesus. I don't know why I always bring that up, because it seems like every time I do that, the following week I experience ways to love Jesus in the car. But I couldn't get past this, because that message wrecked me, because it's like there's so many times when we get wronged in life, there's so many times when things don't go well, we, instead of correctly walking through how we're supposed to handle these things, we bottle it, bottle it all up. After this message, uh, Pastor Beth came back and she preached a message on how to handle conflict. It's like it's all hand in hand in hand. And another obstacle that we find ourselves in, and how do we handle these obstacles in life when things happen and we just have problems and stuff? And... It reminds me of, like, if I have a problem, if I'm going through a heartache in the day and I come home and my wife is annoying, which never happens, 
And what annoying would look like, just so you all understand what I'm trying to say here, is she's happy, she's smiling, she's chipper, everything is going well because she's got Jesus in her heart. And I'm frustrated, and she's like, what's your problem? Don't you have the love? She's not saying this, I'm just, this is my interpretation of, um, which is supposed to be wrong. But what happens in these situations is we start to get into an argument based on the truth is, the problem is I had a, something happen during the day, but for some reason, she has the opportunity to be the punching bag. And we find this all the time in relationships, in friendships, even with siblings. We run into these obstacles where do you realize that when you get into a full-blown fight or an argument, the argument that you started the fight with has nothing to do with what you're talking about anymore? Like the problem is over here, but you decide to go into Crazyville over here and you're fighting something that doesn't make any sense. And you want to know how I know this is true? Because the rest of the argument is you trying to explain what you said and how they didn't interpret the way that you said it. So you now become the defense mode for your story of this is what I said and here's the reality. But the truth in the matter is, is your story is messed up. <laughs> messed up. My dad gave really good advice once. He said, honey, talking to the spouse, if I had agreed with you, we'd both be wrong. <laughs> Don't use that. <laughs> Don't use that. Dad, if you're online, forgive me. I'm sorry. Um, don't use that. But you see, the problem we have, church, is when we have obstacles in life, we do not use the mature way. I'll use the correct way. The mature way of how to handle an argument. My wife and I would get into a little spat over something, and I will say this to her. She drives her crazy. Beth, I'm going to be the mature one here. <laughs> and she's thinking in her mind, just by that statement alone, you're a loser. <laughs> now. I love you. Oh, man. We're going to take a five-minute time out. I'm going to go kiss my wife. No. Um, this is, I, I'm bringing this up because I really want to create something because if I can use us as, a, as, as an obstacle, or not an obstacle, but an object lesson, uh, I really want you just to paint this picture that y'all are just as crazy as we are. Does it make sense? I see a lot of nodding in the heads here. Yes. So we're going to dig deep. My title of my message, though, is called Got This. And this is a question mark. Do you got this? Or it's an exclamation point. Do you got this? Like, you can either say, do I have it? Or I got this. Make sense? And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about three bullet points that are a problem in our life. Well, two of them specifically, but the third is pretty sweet. But bullet point number one is the distraction we're going to talk about. Number two is the lie we're going to talk about. And number three is the testimony. Because at the end of the day, Christ has always been the center. We just got to get through the first two obstacles and realize that he's always been shining through our situation. So uh, if you can open up your scriptures, we're going to talk in uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, and I want to highlight a, a, a chapter here because when Saul was king... And Saul was rocking, he was rocking everywhere he went. Saul and his son Jonathan were godly, godly men. And there's a scene where Jonathan, Saul's son, had an encounter with Philistines. Now, we know the story of David in the Philistines, but we don't really remember the story of Jonathan. And I always am puzzled in that because Jonathan, when you read through scriptures in 1 Samuel, Jonathan was a rock star. Saul was a godly man. And Jonathan had this point in life where he said, hey, there's a bunch of Philistines over there on top of this little hill. I'm going to go get rid of them. Like it was almost like eight on one, if you will. And Jonathan had this thing where he had this thing with God. And he said, you know what? If I walk up there and they taught me and tell me to come up, and they're going to handle me, that means the Lord's going to hand them over. But if they come down to me, that means I'm going to lose the battle. So he walks up, he, he, he looks up at them, and sure enough, they taunt him and say, come up here. So he knew the Lord was going to give it to him. He walks up the hill, and he destroys each one of these men. This is Jonathan. And I wanted to paint a picture of Jonathan being this mighty warrior because just a couple of Bible verses or Bible chapters later, it's the story of David and Goliath. And when Goliath shows up on the scene... 
I'm just scratching my head because Jonathan is never mentioned. Jonathan was never mentioned. Now we, if you read scripture, Saul made a lot of mistakes. And Saul lost the anointing with God, and Jonathan, his son, kind of followed suit. And it's a, it's a heartbreaking story if you follow the story of Jonathan to the end with his dad. But Jonathan was not mentioned, and it started to be where Jonathan was this mighty warrior. Now, what's interesting is Samuel has this word from God that he's going to elect the new king. And Samuel is told to go to the house of Jesse and Jesse's boys, and he's going to elect and anoint the new king. Y'all with me, church? So they show up at the door, and immediately you got roll call. And this is what we do, friends. We, we, if, you, if you remember when you were in middle school or high school and you had two captains and you had to pick your team, do you remember that? Like, oh, I picked this guy because of this, and I picked this person and this person. And the weakest links are usually the, the last picks. It's kind of heartbreaking in a sense. Well, this is kind of the rule of thumb because Eliab was his oldest. He was a tall, strong, good-looking dude. And Eliab is the one that Jesse is thinking, well, obviously it's my firstborn. He's the strongest. He's the greatest. He's the one that would take on the, you know, my inheritance. So it's got to be him. And when Samuel shows up at the door, Samuel even has that same idea. Like, oh, this is easy. But when God speaks, if you go to 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses um, 1 Samuel 17, verses 7, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or a physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the hearts. You see the disconnect we have here? Do you see the promise in this, though? Because if you evaluate your life, how many times have you looked to your right or to your left and compared yourself to somebody else? I've done it many times. I mean, I remember being in an interview, and there's like 30 people in the room, and I'm like sizing myself up, and I'm like, I'm, there's no way I'm going to make it. Like, there's no way that I'm going to make it. This, Johnny Lujak was the guy that I, I, this is my nickname for him, but he was a really like, good-looking dude with a really nice suit. He was very... He was just polished. And I remember going through this interview process, and I'm thinking, well, I got nothing. This guy looks like he has everything. And we made it to the round two interview. There's only five of us. And he walks through the door. I'm like, oh, God dang it. But uh, many people were eliminated. It gets down to two of us. It's me first in the room, and then Johnny Lujak walks through the door. Isn't it funny how I went from like 30 down to two of us and I'm still comparing to one person? There's still this approach of I'm sizing myself up for somebody else. Now, what's beautiful in that story is Johnny Lujak got the kick to the curb. Because God measures the heart, right? <laughs> that guy would have been first on the football team because he was tall like Pastor Carl. But then the Lord told me, I said this with a couple guys this morning, I am a tall, short guy. <laughs> Pastor Carl is a short, tall guy. <laughs> See the difference? I still look up to him, so, hey, Pastor Carl. <laughs> we measure the outside sometimes, church, and God's measuring the inside. So there were seven sons in this room, and Jesse is like literally going, well, if it's not him, it's got to be him. It's got to be him. It's got to be him. To the point where we ran out of boys in the room that are called to be the one that God has chosen to be king. Samuel's confused. Samuel asked the question. This is in verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all of the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he's out keeping the sheep. We got baby David outside. I called him Davy last night. I don't know why. But he's little Davy's outside with the sheep. He didn't even make the appearance to be even qualified from his own father to be the one. Ouch, right? How many of you go through life and you feel like you haven't been accepted and you're going through circumstances today because even your parents didn't see something in you. Or a teacher or somebody that has put an imprint in your life that you don't meet what they would call the standard. 
This, is, this happens more often than normal. Then it goes on, it says, And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes in. So they, se- so they sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes. I guarantee it was blue eyes. Just saying. Just kidding. With bright eyes, good looking, and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for he is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came down on David. And from that day forward, so Samuel rose and went away. Now here's what's important about this, friends. That not good enough was outside, probably because of his age, probably because of his, his ability. But the Lord said, no. You are the one. So there is a distraction right there that he has to live with that his dad doesn't believe in him at the time. His brothers definitely don't believe in him. Now what happens is the battle comes and Goliath shows up and he's taunting the Israelites over and over again and threatening them. Jesse says to baby David out in the field with the sheep, hey, take this food and go bring it to your brothers. They need to eat. Make sure that you do this. Now David shows up on the scene. And he sees what's happening, and he asks some people what's happening because he sees the enemy. And all of a sudden, Eliab, his oldest brother, sees him as well. This is what Scripture says in verses 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, because David's asking, why are we letting this guy taunt God's chosen people? So Eliab, like I said, heard him speak to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. He said, why did you come down here? In whom did you leave those few sheep? You see how he's he's just being kind of a dink? You see how he's disrespecting his brother and now he's saying like, not just sheep, now it's few sheep? You see how he's degrading who he is? You've been there with a sibling before? Raise your hand if you've been in a spat with a sibling before. Be honest. Raise your hand if you win the spats with your siblings. Okay, Uh, okay, okay. Why did you come down here, he says, in those few sheep? I know your pride in your insolence of your hearts, for you have come down here to see the battle. And this is what's important about this church. Are you ready for this? David is presented with a problem. Goliath is on the scene, and Goliath is the enemy. Are you with me? The enemy is against you. But the enemy's deception is he wants to distract you from the real problem. Goliath is the enemy, and because the enemy is good at distractions, Eliab now, his brother, becomes a distraction. Because if I'm going to argue with my brother and I'm bringing food for them and I'm asking a question and I'm seeing that there's something wrong here because this enemy is of the devil and I am saying, hey, what is the deal? Something is about to happen. And all of a sudden, my big brother goes, what is your problem, Davy? You need to do this, this, this. And he could stop right there and go, what is wrong with you? You're such a jerk. You know, they could have got into an argument because that's what we do. That was the distraction that was presented for him. And the blessing in this is he didn't fall for it, church. He literally looked at him and looked away. Now, some scholars believe when he looked away, that's when he saw the enemy. When you don't get bought up into life's distractions, you can see the problem. Y'all with me, church? And when David looked away, he saw it and said to a couple other men, this is wrong. And this enemy needs to go down. The men heard this church, went to Saul and said, hey, there's a guy in the crowd named Davy, little man. He's speaking something really encouraging. you got to hear this. Brings him up to Saul. And all of a sudden, Saul's like, David, you're my heart player. You're little baby Huey. What are you? And David speaks. He is going against our God. Let me have him because he's going to go down. And something happened in those words that even Saul realized that God was speaking directly through this. And when David attacked the giant, he says, I'm coming with the Lord's army, which means Satan be gone. Friends, are you with me? 
When there is a problem, the enemy wants to not get you out of your problem, and the craft here is to make you be distracted. I fall for it all the time. Like I do. It's like when a problem arises, I boil up, I get frustrated. Pastor Carl, Pastor Beth, Pastor Josh, Nathan, they're around me enough. They're like, oh, yep, Dan's got a problem. You can see it on his face. He's not very good at playing cards. When I have a problem, it boils. Now, my disconnect and my defect is I'm emotional. I have an emotional response, which I've been praying about for about 40-some years. But the problem is, I'm constantly reminded of don't be distracted. Take the problem on and watch what I'll do if you get out of the way. But if I'm boiling with something, everything around me is a problem. Everything. We have to be able to disconnect from this and allow God in, but we have to identify where the distractions are, church. Are you with me? Because when David didn't get distracted, the enemy was destroyed. And that is the greatest lesson that I'm learning in this, is when I get out of the way of the distractions and allow God to use me or use the circumstance to bless because everything works out for his glory. No matter what, whether I like it or not, the Bible says that everything will work out for the good. Y'all with me? everything don't be distracted don't let the distractions of this world take you out now the lies the enemy is the prince of lies but i want to stop here for a moment because i want to make a very bold statement i am no way shape or form giving too much credit to the enemy because he doesn't have any credit like, his, his whole purpose is to destroy us. John 10.10 10 says he tries to come to seek and destroy. But God says, but I've come to bring a real and eternal life. I don't give credit to the devil because when Jesus shows up, the devil is conquered. If someone has a problem and they throw out the devil this, the devil this, I say thus say it, meaning that Jesus is here and the devil has to flee. I don't give the devil credit, but I also am aware that the devil used tactics, and sometimes I fall into it because I have fleshly problems. I, I'm not strong enough in a sense, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords, lords that resides within me is the conquering person that takes care of the problems. Y'all with me, church? So when I'm talking about all the tactics of the devil, make no mistake that through the Christ-centered lifestyle, he's weak. He's a pune. He's like Spacely from Spacely Sprockets on the Jetsons cartoon. Little guy. And he's a short, short guy. He, yeah, anyways. He's, he's really short. You spoke and I heard you. I, I can't look at my wife because she's a distraction. A good distraction, church. How you doing? <laughs> the lie. The lie. Moses, remember the story of Moses? Moses, when you think about it, he's a miracle baby because, well, Pharaoh wanted to eliminate all these babies, throw them in the, throw them in the river. And Moses was found floating in a river, and Pharaoh's daughter is the one that found him. And the miraculous story in that is, is I mean, if you had a half a brain... There's a lot of babies in the river. But they found one floating, and his daughter takes and goes, oh, that must not be one of those kids. Why don't you raise them up in our household? In fact, the Lord even gave an opportunity for his mother to nurse the baby. It's like only, only but God in this story. But Moses gets in trouble. He flees. He has an encounter with God through a burning bush. And his entire Life is going to churn because God says, I'm going to use you and you're going to do great things. And he's now protesting God over and over and over again because he's believing the lie that he does not meet the qualifications. It's kind of like the boys over in the house of Jesse 
When we look at the outward appearance, Moses is looking at everything. It's like, I can't even speak very good. My words don't have, like, I, I struggle with my words. God, you, you're mistaken here. He's believing the lies about himself. Are you with me, church? So Moses goes through all kinds of encounters. He sees the hand of God move the miraculous miracles through his ministry because he said, yes, regardless of feeling qualified. Now, what's interesting about this passage here is Moses wrote many books. And scholars believe that the first couple psalms were written by Moses, which is Psalm 90 and Psalm 91. And what's powerful about Psalm 91 is, raise your hand if you know Psalm 91. My mother, when I was a little kid, and she claims to this very day that she prays this prayer over each one of her children, this is the most powerful, powerful Bible chapter on the protection of God. Moses' speculation, scholars indicate that this is towards the end of Moses' life. When I went through the chronological order, this was literally right before Moses died, this Bible verse is what you read in the readings. And it's Psalm 91, and it talks, I'm just going to read just a few, a few verses here. It says, uh, Psalm 91, verses 5, it says, Do not be afraid for the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes in, by, at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, it will make the Most High, your shelter. No evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up in their hands. And so you, will, you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. I'm going to read this last part here again. It says, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up in their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. That's a powerful statement. Would you agree? Okay. So we're going to fast forward to Jesus. Because what's important here is in Matthew, you have the story of Jesus walking up and seeing his cousin John the Baptist baptizing people. And John the Baptist doesn't want to baptize Jesus because he's like, I'm not even worthy. But there's an encounter and Jesus gets baptized. And the second he comes out, the Holy Spirit descends on him. The Bible says like a dove. And a loud voice from the clouds, you hear our Heavenly Father says, this is my son in who I am pleased. God is speaking jesus and the water and the holy spirit man you have the trinity in one scene can you imagine the anointing in this place now the bible says that right after this it says the spirit of god led i'm gonna say it again the spirit of god led jesus to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil wait a minute god led this Yes, the Spirit of God led Jesus. Now, what that means to me is sometimes my problems might be part of his plan. When Jesus says, take heart, I've overcome the world, in this life we will face many trials and sorrows, but take hearts. Did God make it happen? I don't know. Could he have? Absolutely. What for? For his kingdom. For his kingdom. Now, but the enemy is crafty because when the devil tries to tempt Jesus, the enemy uses all kinds of tactics. The very first one is, hey, turn this rock into bread and eat it. Jesus is like, no, God says you can't test the Lord. So then the devil got even more crafty in this one because he's like, okay, you're going to use that. I'm going to use truth against you. And the devil decides to use Scripture against Jesus. Truth. The devil is going now to use truth. And why this is important is because sometimes truth is a little bit tainted if you're not understanding good and evil. And the devil says to Jesus, quoting Moses, Psalm 91 the devil is now quoting Jesus. I better get to my Bible verse. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Quoting him. It says, the devil took Jesus to the holy place. This is in Matthew chapter 4, verses 5. It says, the devil took 
took him to the holy place of Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the Son of God, jump. For the scriptures say, this is Psalm 91, he will order his angels to protect you, and he will hold you up in their hands, and you will not even hurt your foot on the stone. Quoting Psalm 91. Ouch. You see how important it is to be in the Word, to know the Word? Because that was Moses' words, the one that Moses even said, my words don't matter, they're not good enough, and God is now using Jesus to quote him. Now the devil's using Moses' words and saying, hey, how, how about this? And then Jesus quotes him again in this, and Jesus overcomes and says, um, where, where are we at here? He says, the Scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God, quoting Moses in Deuteronomy. So it's Moses in the battle of the devil versus Jesus. Now, I mean, think about this. Now, I can't wait to meet Moses. I mean, he's one of those guys you just can't wait to meet. It's like, dude, like, you heard from God. You split a Red Sea through the power of God, and the first thing you do is you listen to your father-in-law and tell you you're doing everything wrong? Like, good for you, because that was the chapter of how we designated work and order in a church. But what was powerful about this is I want to meet Moses because it's like, man, your words were used by our Savior to overcome the devil. Do you understand that? Like, Jesus has the power in the light. He is everything. But he used a man's words that was anointed by God to overcome our enemy. Do you see the power in this? But the lies the enemy wants to present to us, the deception he wants to present to us, he wants to take us out of our problem. He wants us to be stuck in it. He wants us to focus on, here's the issue. Your issue is you have anxiety. Your issue is you have hurts. Your issue is you don't believe in yourself. Your issue is this. And what he's going to try to do is make everyone come against you or make you feel that way. He wants to distract you. Are you with me? Getting towards the end here, church. The devil tried to use truth to take Jesus out. He tried to use truth. John 1, I love this passage, because John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, uh, excuse me, in the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was God, and the Word, the word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God is the word. The devil tried to use the word to twist Jesus, but Jesus was the word. You see the power in this? You can't twist the word when he is the word because it's his word. And let's go right to the last bullet point. And this is important for us to understand. The enemy's tactics are meaningless. And do not have the authority because of our God. And if we get out of the mess, and if we allow God into the situation, and we allow God into our circumstances, watch what he's going to do. Because every person in this room and every person online, we have the greatest gift in our tool bag. The greatest gift. And it is our testimony. Every single character in the Bible once was lost, but now found through our Savior. You can evaluate your walk, your life, your circumstance, everything you're in. You need to reflect on where is God in this? Because mark my words, He is with you. He is for you. He's not against you. And He is writing your story that's going to bless, encourage, shift, touch, breakthroughs in other people's lives if you acknowledge him. If you realize that what you do, including some of your greatest mistakes, he is going to bless you and he's going to touch the hearts of others if you get out of the rut. Worship team, if you guys can make your way forward. I'm going to close quick with a, a couple thoughts here. Revelation 12, 11 says, We have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. 
The word is God. Testimony is talking about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It never has not been about Jesus. Moses ran from problems. God shows up and an entire nation goes to get freed and sent to the promised land. David had many obstacles in the beginning and even in his ministry made mistakes. But in the end, will always go down in history as the man after God's own hearts. David. So what I want to challenge and leave you with is this. Friends, don't give up. How many times have you tried to start something? You take it on for a few weeks, maybe 90 days, and it got hard or you made a mistake and you quit. Could be anything. Don't give up. Friends, you need to dream. Don't stop dreaming. Those thoughts from our Heavenly Father that He's instilled in your heart and your life and what you see, He wants you to step into that. Dream. You haven't had your best moments yet. You haven't preached your best sermon. You haven't laughed your greatest laugh. You haven't sang your greatest song. You haven't written down your greatest ideas. For many of us, we haven't had our greatest day yet. You are a miracle waiting to happen. You have all kinds of things that are locked up inside of you, good and bad. You bottle it all up. And it's like the Lord saying, bring it out. Let it come forth. For those visions and dreams that you've been holding on to, praying into, the Lord is calling me into this. Come forth. Watch what he will do. Something awesome is about to happen in your life. Claim it. Believe it. Know it. Don't let anybody tell you you are too young. Don't let anybody tell you that you are too old. Don't let anybody tell you anything. Because the God is the center of everything. And my word says if you seek God, everything works out. Everything. Take hold of our God. Take hold of His Son. Watch what He's going to do in you, through you, around you. Because you are a beacon of hope and light and truth because of our Savior. Don't wrestle anymore. It's a good day, amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this awesome group of people that I call family. And Father, I'm praying as we go back into worship, Lord, that you just touch our hearts. Father, the call today is a passion, a burning fire of your Holy Spirit to set into our hearts and in our minds. And Father, as we worship, I'm praying that we can shake off all of the junk in the world, all of the fear, all of the doubt, all of the religion, let it go down. And Father, as we worship, I'm praying for freedom, I'm praying for visions, I'm praying for dreams. Help us dream, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You ready to erupt in your life? You ready to see the Holy Spirit? Why don't you start with worship right now? Join us. Stand if you're able. Let's worship Jesus. The altars are always open. If you want to come and pray, if you feel led to pray for somebody, do it. If you want to bless somebody, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. Focus on Pastor Carl and his family. This man has a call, an anointing. You can write a card. Pray over Pastor Carl and his family. Let's worship Jesus. Feel it in this room Holy Spirit move Cause when you have your way Something has to break
tear down every lie Set the wrong things right Cause when you have your way Something has to break Something has to break Right now in your name Something has to break I believe you lead me through it. I believe that you will do right now. I believe you get me to it. I believe you lead me through it. I believe that you will do it right now. Something has to break. I believe you get me to it. I believe you lead me through it. I believe that you will do it right now. Something has to break. Something has to break. Something has to break. Something has to break. To break. I believe. I believe you get me to it. I believe you lead me through it. I believe you lead to it right now. Something has to break. I believe you get me to it. I believe you lead me through it. I believe that you will do it right now. Something has to break. Something has to break.
says in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. That's, that's what we heard this morning, right? It's the promise. It's the truth, and it's trusting in faith of what he has for us. So as we close today, I want to pray with you and pray over you. I want to bless you, and I want to let you be able to be free to keep moving however God's asking you to move today. So pray with me. God, we just thank you for your promise. We thank you for the promise that we're your children, that we're, we're in your hand, that you are for us and not against us, that you are our high shelter, that you are the one that beckons us home today, that you are the one that calls us in in these moments. So we thank you, Jesus, that you are the answer, that you are the victor, that you are the one that stands and fights and beckons on our behalf. We thank you, Jesus. It's your hand that we stand and hold today. We claim your name, the holy name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Receive this blessing that Aaron prayed over the children of Israel. For this is you. You are the children of God, the children of his mighty hand. So I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. I pray the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
I pray the Lord lift up his countenance, his favor upon you today. I pray that he gives you his peace. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So be it. So be it. Amen. Amen. The word closes. Let us think of ways to motivate one another in acts of love and good works to each other. So the challenge is continue to worship, continue to pray. But if God has a word for somebody in the house, please share that word. If you've got something where God's stirring on your heart, find somebody, pray over them, stand together. Activate what God has placed inside of you right now in this moment. Let him be who he is. Love you guys. Appreciate you guys. Be blessed and be the kingdom.